so uh, I will very quickly review something from last time just to make sure that it's uh, well covered. Uh, it's section number two, so we're back to chapter seven, section number two, and within section number two, it's not on PowerPoint, three concepts. One is called job analysis, the other one is job description, and the third one is job specification. And job analysis is simply what the job does. It's trying to analyze, meaning to break down each job and each position, what it requires to do step by step by step. So in analysis, you try to break things down into its basic components and to see what the different steps are. So what is a waitress generally doing? Well, she's got to welcome the customer, then she's got to seat them at the table, then she has to offer them maybe something to drink, then she has to offer them a menu, then she's got to, let's say, take the order or give them three, five minutes to think, get the order, and so on. Now, the new guys soon are going to be thrown out, okay? So, that's job analysis. Let me repeat. It's a process in which the workflow, workflow means step by step, is analyzed, and you see what the job needs and requires in terms of steps. Next one is job description. And a job description is a written statement. So, you actually write, and let's make sure it's right, uh, what that describes the job. So, it's a written description of the job. And the last job specification means the minimum requirements which you want for the job holder or for the job applicant. So, if someone's going to be teaching at a university, the minimum requirement is usually a master's degree. The desire is doctorate degree. So, what we are saying here is what's the minimum requirement? Minimum requirement for you to become students is a high school diploma. All right? For a waitress, maybe not even a high school diploma is needed. Sometimes they require time, oftentimes they don't. So, these are the three fundamental concepts. I think last time we discussed uh, how to recruit applicants uh, from the current slide. We said you do an internal search, which is within the company. You advertise in newspaper, radio, TV, on the internet. You also use employee referrals, other so employees in the company will tell you that they know somebody who can do the job. You also have public employment agencies. This is an employment agency organized by the government. You got many private employment agencies. You also have school placements. And you also have temporary health services. How about if your girls lock the door behind you? Lock the door. Alright, no one else is coming in. School placement. We also have temporary health services, employee leasing. I covered it all last time. We also said about firing. You fire them, the job is over, the job is not coming back, the employee is not coming back. Next one is layoff. It is only temporary. Look, the two of you are quiet, okay? Yes. All right, you need five minutes? I mean, I can give you ten. Layoffs. You say, hey, there is no need for you. Maybe next month, maybe after two months, 
or if it's tourism, it's a low season, no customers, you go home, it's temporary, after a few days, after a few weeks, or after a few months, you can come back to your job. You have attrition. You don't hire any new people. You don't hire any new people. Those that leave, they leave. The number is shrinking. You also have transfers. You can move them to another position at the same level, or you can move them downward position. You also have reduced work weeks. They say you have two people taking the job. It's also saying or similar to job sharing. You do Monday, you do Tuesday, you do Wednesday, you do Thursday, you do Friday, you do Saturday. That's one way to go. Another way within the job sharing and reduced work week is you do the morning, you do the afternoon. You do the morning, you do the afternoon. Then you do the morning, you do the afternoon. So you share mornings with afternoons or one day with another day, whatever the arrangement is. And of course, early retirement. When people are 62 or 63, close to retirement, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three years to retirement, if it's a major corporation, will offer them an early retirement so that they're not anymore a burden to say look instead of getting you a full hundred percent of your retirement we offer you maybe 90 percent so that you don't have to work anymore and some people say yeah i'll take that one now the next step we discussed was selecting job applicants in selecting job applicants you have two major errors that you can make and the errors are a reject error and an accept error in an accept error you take an employee which is not really good but you accept them for the job that's usually a problem because the employee is not going to do any good work you still have to train them you still have to get them up to speed it's usually costly and then you have to fire them and then you have to rehire again you go through the whole thing so hiring the wrong employee is a relatively expensive error in many businesses okay the other type of error is called a reject error in a reject error you take a good employee, a successful employee, or employee which would be successful if hired, but you don't hire them. You don't hire them for some reasons. Come on, guys. All right? So, you don't hire them for some reason. In this case, we say that you reject them. Reject means basically not accept them. So you don't give them a job but they could and be doing a really good job. So these are the two fundamental errors that you have to be aware. Each one is costly. In this case you you have a bad employee and you give them a job. In this case you got a good employee but you don't give them a job. Alright Next, unfortunately, they don't have very many explanations over here. PowerPoint is not good. It is about selection criteria, and the criteria are reliability and validity. So, we need to say, yeah, they don't have anything. So, I gotta explain what is mean reliable and what is mean valid. All right, let's provide a couple of examples for both for you to understand. Suppose I am, uh, let's say, 58 kilograms on it. You can move the camera over here. So I'm 58 kilograms. I just happen to know that that's what I am. And you got a little scale, okay? You scale, you step on it, and it shows 59 point Three. Then I step again a second time, 
to measure, and the scale says 60.2. Then I step a third time, make a third measure, and it says 61.0. I step a fourth thumb, and it says 58. Now, question is, is this scale good or is this scale bad? You zoom in here at the numbers a little bit. Zoom in on the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just on vacation. So, the answer is the scale, not good. The scale is not good. It provides too many, two different numbers. In this case, it has a very high, we say, variation, which is the same as deviation. So it varies to 59, 60, 58, okay? So the scale is no good. So that's one example of a problem. Now let me give you another example of a problem. I do know that I'm 58 kilograms, but the scale says 61.0, then it says 61.1, then it says 61.0, then it says 61.0, then it says 61.1. Here, in this case, you got a very, very close numbers, but it's off by three kilograms, okay? So, you got a completely different problem. So every time on stepping it, it gives you the same number, but every time it gives you the wrong number. Number, no good. The real number is 58, but it gives you 61. So, this one is no good because it's giving you different numbers. And this one is no good because it's giving you essentially the same number, but it's the wrong number, okay? So in this case, you got one type of measurement problem. And here, you got a different type of measurement problem, okay? Here, the problem is that it says it is not reliable. Every time it gives you a different. So we write here, not reliable. Not reliable. If you have a measure, any measure for anything, you want it to be reliable. Now, this one is reliable. This one is reliable. Every time it gives you practically the same number. But there is a problem. This one is not precise. Alright. So, this is an example where there is no reliability and this is an example where there is no precision if you want a measure to be good it must be both reliable and it must be precise at the same time so when we're getting back to this when we are using any type of selection criteria you want the criteria to be reliable and you want the criteria to be valid, as in precise, okay? So, example of a, a criteria which is not valid is you're hiring a waitress and you want the waitress to be tall, okay? Well, is it a valid criterion to hire only tall waitresses? Well, could a short waitress do the job very well? The answer is yes, of course. Could a normal height waitress do a good job? The answer is yes, of course. So, asking for a particular height, how tall a waitress is, is not really a valid selection criteria. You don't have to select them based on how tall they are. 
You also should not base it on how long their hair is, okay? They may have short hair and do a great job. They may have a long hair and do a great job. Now, what could be a little more valid for a waitress is, does she know a second language? Maybe like English? Well, does she know a third language? Maybe Russian, if you got Russian customers. Maybe Chinese, if you have Chinese customers. Okay. So, language definitely helps in the job. And language makes a big difference in the job. And requiring another language or requiring English is a good, valid requirement. Requiring long hair is not a really valid requirement, okay, for the job of a waitress. Okay, maybe for some other job, but not in this particular case. So when you are selecting employees, you have to be careful to require some sort of a measure which is both valid and reliable. Let's see now some of these. Uh, let's see what they have. You use for the measure tests and interviews. So usually when you're hiring somebody, you'll give them a basic form of a test. And you'll oftentimes give them an interview. And this gets here, let's see now, different type of test. Number one is simply give them a written test. You give them a written test, you ask them a few questions, whatever that might be. If it's for a lawyer, you hire a lawyer, you can ask them specific, make them a legal test. If it's a doctor, make them a medical test. So if it's a waitress, you ask them basic questions for them to answer. How do you handle this? How do you handle that? What is this? What is that? Whatever the test is. So one example of a test is a written test. You give them a short test. This is what we do here at the university, at least for this course. We give you written tests. Okay? They're not for a job, but it's a similar thing. So written test is one. Let's see what else. Next one is called performance simulation test. Simulation means you put them in the same environment or you put them in a very similar environment and you give them a chance to work. You give them a chance to do what they're supposed to do. Okay? So that's one very simple way. For example, boss sits on the table you got a waitress and she's supposed to serve him as if he's the customer. Now, he's not a real customer, but they're testing the waitress to see how she's doing. Or if you have a bartender, the boss will say, well, make me this kind of drink and let's see if the bartender can do the drink and instead of giving it to a customer, the boss will check for himself. After the boss is happy with five or ten group drinks, then the bartender can begin to serve real customers. Alright, so this is a simulation type test. You can also have what's called a work sampling. And the work sampling is very simple. You give them one hour of work. Hey, let, let's see how they're going to you know, serve real customers for an hour or maybe for a day or maybe for a week, okay? If it's for a week, it's a little bit longer than the regular test. But you just give them. Now, when they hire university professors, they usually give them a chance to present one lecture, one lecture in front of students, or to present a research, research paper they've done. So they get a chance to talk for an hour to some audience, and that's yet another way to test the amount short term for a very short and quick period of time. Let's see what they have over here. You also have what's called a job interview. And you pretty much have a job interview all the time. In a job interview, you can 
provide, and they have an example, a uh, role play. Very similar to what I explained. It's an exercise, and it's part of the interview where you give them a critical situation, and in that critical situation, you ask them what they do. For example, you're hiring a waitress, you give her, put her in a situation where she spills the drink on the boss. How is she gonna react, okay? Is she gonna react adequately? Well, she spills the drink on a customer. What is she gonna do? How is she gonna do? How is she going to handle that situation? Or she's just walking around and suddenly the meal slips or the glass slips and the glass breaks. I mean, these things do happen. So you put them, you put them in what's called a critical situation. A critical situation is a situation which is not quite normal, but could happen. And if it happens, you want to see them how they react and how quickly they react. If they're experienced, if they know, they'll react within one or two seconds. And they'll handle the situation quickly. If they panic, no good. Usually that's the end of the interview. So, you may have some role-playing job interview. You give a certain position and you try to see how they're going to respond to it. Let's see what else. Okay, other things. We should begin any type of job selection with an application for. Any time an applicant comes and wants the job, you give them, you ask them, fill out this application for. And in the application form, they're going to give you basic information. They're going to give you their full names, they're going to give you their social security number or ID number. They may give you their nationality. <clears throat> you may require to give to, uh, to you may require your their employment status. Are they foreigners? Are they locals? Do they have the right to work? Do they have a work visa if they're foreigners? Whatever their status is, you're going to ask them about their age. You may possibly ask them about their marital status or children, are they married, do you have children, whatever. So you basically collect certain amount of information in the application form. So you always do what's called application. You also do what's called screening and pre-screening. You got 20 people for the job and you get to screen them. This basically means you got 20 people for being a waitress and you ask and you want to see which one you're going to choose. And pre-screening could be, hey, if you got 20 applicants, you pick the age. You hire them between the age of 20 and 30. Or you hire them between the age of 25 and 30. Or you can say, we're going to hire them if they know three languages. So, they'll know local Thai language, they'll know English language, they may know one more language, let's say Chinese or some other. So, you say, we're going to first choose the one with three languages. If there's no one with three languages, but there are some with two languages, then you say, with pre-screening, we choose those with two languages. All the others that don't know English can basically go. You eliminate. So, you have a pre-screening process where you have too many applicants and you want to eliminate a whole bunch of them. You put something which you really like to have. It's called the desired, desired criteria, which is not required, which is not really necessary. So, that's the pre-screening part. Let's see what else we have. Here. Part of an interview, when you make an interview, the interview has to be realistic. And a job interview should usually have two parts. In the first part, the employer 
interviews employees. It can last maybe 20 minutes, it can last one hour. If the employee feels very good and promising, they can extend the interview for two hours or three hours, okay? So sometimes they will do that. And the second part of the interview is the employer will tell them about the job. So, for example, let me give you two examples of my own experience in my own hiring. When I was applying in March of 2000 to a major corporation, they had what's called a job fair. And on the job fair, I'm showing up in four or five different places. On one of them, I spoke with the boss for about one hour. And he says, look, everything's great. I like you. I want to hire you. But can you come tomorrow or the day after tomorrow for a full day interview? I want you to meet all the other managers and I want you to meet key employees. So you're going to meet about 8, 10 people and based on their feedback, I'll make a hiring decision. And I said, sure, I can come tomorrow if you like. He said, okay, tomorrow between 9 and 9.30, you come here, you're going to be looking for me, we're going to arrange for your lunch, so we're going to have three meetings in the morning and about three meetings in the afternoon. So I had a full day interview, which lasted about six, seven hours, they gave me lunch and everything else, and basically he said, I'm going to call you tomorrow. And the next day they called me and said, hey, we'd like to offer you a job. Can you start Monday morning? And I said, sure. They said, okay, come over tomorrow, Thursday or Friday, get your paperwork done. Monday morning is 9 o'clock work. Come tomorrow, find this person so they can give you the contract and everything. So that's an example of an interview. So essentially, when I did the first interview for an hour, it was effectively a pre-screening process. He's going to probably see 20 people or 30 people that day. He's going to pick two. From these two, he's going to make a full-blown interview. And based on the interview, they're going to hire one or two people. The other example will be interview, job interview for this university. They said, okay, can you make interview on Skype and you can put a camera? I said, sure. And the interview lasted about one hour. And in the first 45 minutes, they're asking me, uh, what about this? Where did you teach? Did you teach this? Did you teach that? Did you teach that? Uh, well, what kind of exams you give? What kind of classes you have? What were the size of the classes? What about this? What are some of the most difficult stuff? So basically, they ask a whole bunch of questions. And then the last 15 minutes, I do. And I begin to ask a lot of questions. And I ask them, well, uh, how many days in the week do I have to be? Do I have a 9 to 5 uh, office I have to sit? Well, how many days off? What's the vacation that we have? How many different classes do I have to teach? Well, what is the size of each class? Uh, in all of those little questions which I have. So that's basically what an interview is. It can take easily one to two hours if the interview is serious, okay? So this is all about job interview. Let's see what we have. In a closing your deal basically means that you want to be able to attract the good employee and the hardest part in any, for any employer is once you attract a good employee to keep them. And I think I told you last time because there's a general rule in human resources that the good employees always leave and find a better job. It just happens. That's the nature of things. So whenever you have a good employee, it is very, very, very important to do, to make the effort to keep them. All right, section number three. And section number three is training. So 
let's go back to the very beginning of the to the very beginning of the slides here the steps all right let's review quickly the steps is what we covered so far the first phase is this and the first phase is identification and selection and the first phase has three steps oh yeah party time <laughs> all right all right you go and take care outside so step first phase has three steps all right everyone number one planning and we discussed the planning planning basically is what workers you have and what you're going to need Set, second step is recruitment and downsizing in recruitment you select people how you actually are able to attract them and in downsizing how you actually get rid of them how you lay them off so far i've been discussing step number three selection you already have a bunch of uh, applicants you already have a bunch of people based on the recruitment now you need to select the employees so i discussed the test and the job interviews and everything else now we're moving to phase two and phase two is step number four orientation and training so anytime you hire an employee once they're hired you got to provide them basic orientation and maybe some training so here we're discussing step four and step five of phase two which is orientation and training so job orientation let's get back to job orientation Determining whether training. Yeah, they don't know anything about orientation. This is weird. So, what is job orientation? Job orientation basically is usually a day or two. You just tell the employee what is where and how it works. Let me give you, you guys. All right. Just move on. Okay. Somewhere up front of the back, far away. Okay and a little bit forward all right just a little so what is orientation example when i arrive here first part of the orientation is to tell me hey this is where the university is okay next this is where the dorm is this is where you sleep then the next step is this is where your office is. This is the building where you're teaching. Next, this is your office. This is how you open it. This is how you lock it. This is your computer. This is how you start it. Part of the orientation is they give you login and password. Then they tell me this is where the academic office is. This is how you print. This is where the printer is. This is where the photocopier is. This is where you go for lunch. This is where you get your coffee, okay? So in orientation is simple, common sense stuff, which we usually know or understand, but we need to see for the first time. I mean, how can I possibly know where is the photocopier? Well, they're just going to show this is where the photocopier is. And then ask, well, where's my mailbox? And say, oh, yeah, your mailbox is there, okay? Where I get my mail. So in orientation, for example, if you're hiring a waitress, you tell her, well, this is where the refrigerator is, and this is where the freezer is, and this is where the drinks are, this is where the kitchen, and this is where the trays, this is where the napkins are. So you basically tell them. So the orientation for a waitress could be literally one hour. In one hour, you can show her everything that you need to know. Now, for a receptionist at the hotel, you got to explain to them 
where is parking, how they park, and where customers park, and where the employee park. Okay, then you gotta tell them about keys and everything. So the introduction or the orientation for a receptionist is a way bigger job. It can easily take one day. You can tell them, okay, this is the last floor, this is only for whatever, and this is the second floor. I mean, it's a long process to familiarize a receptionist with a fairly large hotel. And if the hotel has a spa, and if the hotel has a fitness room, and if the hotel has a swimming pool and all the other facilities, you have to show them one by one. You gotta, and then you gotta tell them, swimming pool is open from 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the evening. The fitness room is open from 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening. So, the receptionist should know and learn all of those things. So you have to explain them on the first or on the second day of the job. You gotta explain them the basics of what is where, what works, how and where. Even though they may have been receptionists for 10 or 20 years, they still have to know. I may have been teaching at, let's say, 10 universities for 15 years, they still have to tell me how to log into the computer, what's my login and password. They still have to tell me where's the photocopier and what is my passcode for the photocopier, okay? This has nothing to do with me not having skills, it's me understanding the system. Again, they should show me, they did, this is our LMS system, this is how you get to the LMS system, and this is your login and password, okay? So this is all part of the orientation. In the orientation, again, a day, maybe two, if the job is too easy, maybe two hours, if the job is complicated, maybe as much as one week, you get to learn the basics of that particular workplace. And that's about job orientation, which is step number four. Let's take a break here and then we'll continue with step number five.